a carte blanche. You could do like what we wanted to, and the director would say, okay, let's try that, let's try that, let's try that. The second one, they definitely had an outline of what was going to happen. And there was the, the, the original Allegoria, which was very, I think, um, very abstract. Uh, and this one, I think they wanted to have a bit more of a storyline. So there was um, something to follow, but still some space to create. Uh, yeah. Cool. Um, and uh, Amanda, I am having trouble uh, remembering uh, uh, Amaluna. Yes, Amaluna. This sounds so similar to names. <laughs> I know. All the names run together, don't they? Yeah. I still, I almost call my show Amaluna sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> and there's and that makes me feel better. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> You're good. Um, I think we have, so we have a, we have a clip of, of that. It's a little less narrative. So what I'd like to do is, is maybe chat with you while we watch it. Um, Joe's going to sure. bring, bring the sound down. And then later on, uh, for our viewers, I have a, a clip of your performance that I, I hope is okay to, uh, to show. Um, so, so we'll, we'll chat over this one and then later on we'll, we'll just stop and listen. Um, so this clip that Joe is pulling up right now is a section of Amaluna. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Cirque du Soleil is doing something really cool, and this is just, uh, I'll mention this while Joe goes to screen share, is that uh, they're making sections of their work available in hour-long pieces online. So make sure to check out their website when we're done, uh, because that uh, is where these are from. They're, they're all on YouTube, but they've collected them really beautifully on their website. Oh, okay. Uh, so this is just a Amaluna. Uh, that's you on the water bowl. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. This one is sort of the trailer. So we get glimpses of you uh, sort of um, managing everything in the background. Um, yes. We get sort of a, a closer up of you and as Prospera. Now, I saw another clip, uh, the one that uh, Cirque du Soleil has up. Uh, there's another one who, uh, there's a different uh, uh, singer and musician playing your role, so I, I didn't want to feature it, but there's this, uh, this device that lifts you up into the air while you play. Is that the same for your show? Uh, yes, what happened, that was a, a moon, essentially, <laughs> uh, and during one of the acts, the storm act, uh, when I caused the storm, uh, I, I sit in the moon and uh, I start playing cello and the moon lifts me up into the air and I start flying through the air with me. That later on, when we did the revamp of Amaluna, uh, the moon was taken out. Okay. Uh, so we had to come up with another way to still be able to, you know, for me to start the storm. Uh, and, and, and play. So I went on the water bowl. I, I start in the middle of the stage, go to the front of the stage, then make my way to the water bowl. It's the interesting thing about those shows is they're constantly evolving. I remember just as an outsider watching Amanda, it's just a beautiful moment. I really love that part of the show. And I was like, oh no, I can't believe they, but these are, I can't believe they took it out. It's so iconic and gorgeous and beautiful. But things are, like, you wouldn't, you wouldn't believe that the amount of small things that just have different little repercussions, chain reactions, so eventually it makes the show change, makes the show change, makes the show change. Yeah. It's all the time. Yeah. <laughs> um, now I'm curious, so, so that's sort of the last, the super, super recent. If we could delve way back, I'm, I, I know, especially, you know, with having uh, so many young people in our uh, programs and, and in our audience, those who are, are training right now, I, I'd love to hear a, a snapshot sort of a, a life story recap. I mean, you know, we, we do only have a, a limited time, uh, sure. but, but I, I'm, you know, I'm sure our audience would love to hear sort of like your origins and where you came from and kind of how you landed to, uh, to be the performers that you are today. Sure. Um, sure. Well, I started music, I started learning music when I was three years old. Uh, and my grandfather started teaching me to learn 
music before I learned how to read. <laughs> so in my house, it was always like, okay, you have to practice first before you do your homework. So <laughs> music was always more important uh, than anything else. And I think that's because my mom's side of the family, they were all musicians. So it was just, you know, part of it's in my blood. So, uh, so I started there and I continued, uh, on, I started on piano, uh, playing piano. And which I believe every kid should always start on piano, no matter what instrument you want to learn, always start on piano. Uh, and then I, at, when I was seven, year old, seven years old, I started cello. And I went through college with both and joined orchestras, but then realized I did not want to be in an orchestra for the rest of my life. And oh, I... What was it about that? Um, there were many, many reasons. It was just not the right atmosphere for me. I really wanted to, I love movies. I love the film industry. So I wanted to move to Los Angeles and record uh, music for movies. So uh, I didn't know anybody. So it took a long time, a long time to climb up that ladder. But uh, yeah. I start uh, I did some video games I did uh, some music for the Simpsons family guy uh, never quite made a big feature film but that's okay <laughs> it's yes. still in the future <laughs> yeah but then uh, when Cirque du Soleil was opening a show in Hollywood um, I saw the uh, the auditions for it and I thought to myself oh my god there's a million musicians, a million cellists, all in LA. They're all auditioning. I was like, I'm not going to get that. Uh, and I just talked myself out of auditioning until the very last day, the day the audition tape is due. I thought, okay, you know what? I'm going to do it. I'm just going to audition, send in my tape. And uh, then they called me the next day for another audition. Basically had three more auditions <laughs> for that. And, and I got the role, so. You know what, Amanda, you bring up something really interesting that I think that we, we should just address for a moment, which is this idea of imposter syndrome, right? Which I think yes. that sometimes, uh, you know, I see our young performers uh, feeling it, uh, and then, you know, maybe you're a little older and you're still feeling it, and you're like, well, every time you look up and you think, well, sh certainly this person doesn't feel it. Uh, I mean, yeah. Do the two of you still feel imposter syndrome to today every once in a while? Oh, absolutely. I'm feeling it right now. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. And I think that it's completely 100% normal to feel that way because, yeah, I mean, there's always going to be somebody out there that, um, you know, that is going to be better, uh, you know, than you in, in, in certain things. and you're going to be better than they are at certain things. So you just have to accept it and continue to, to really do your best. You know, do you uh, work as hard as you can so that in the end you can say, you know, I, I'm, you know, I'm working hard and I deserve to be where I am. And, and always remember that, that you deserve, you know, wherever you are at that moment, uh, you deserve to be there. And you put in that hard work, uh, just as everybody else has. Yeah. Uh, Eric, uh, what was uh, sort of your origin? I mean, I, I know I know a, a, about that, but I'd love for you to share that. Um, you do, do you? I'd like yeah, to hear that. Yeah, I know that. a thing or two. Uh, for those in the audience, uh, uh, Eric and I had the pleasure of uh, meeting a few different times. Uh, the last couple of times he's been in Chicago. Um, I got to help uh, produce uh, the last time you taught here, I believe, yeah. which was in 2018. Um, but I'd love to hear uh, how you how you came to Cirque. Uh, I know it's been a long and storied road, so. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I grew up in a, a very small little village in Kansas. Uh, we didn't even really have a stoplight, so very small. Um, and that sounds so dangerous. <laughs> Super dangerous. Well, yeah, there wasn't much traffic going through there. But um, I think when I got into high, you know, I really didn't start. I was a really late boomer compared to Amanda. Like I, uh, I started. Um, well, 
maybe the seeds of it was, you know, I, there used to be a game on TV called Make Me Laugh. And there were these, there was a audience contestant and a comedian. And if the, if the audience member could keep from laughing at the comedian, they'd win money. And uh, I, I used to love to hear my mother laugh. And so she would, we would play that game. She said, like, a, set an egg timer for 60 seconds, and we could do anything, but we couldn't touch each other. So, but anything, we did some comedy. The other ones were kind of like a, a mischievous comedy. So I, I also kind of went towards those because I thought, okay, here's something where I got I to play, make people laugh if I'm lucky. And I can be very ridiculous. I can use my body a lot. And then sometimes, too, they involve kind of a fantastical nature. It wasn't just quite being human. And I think I also like fantasy things a little bit. So, and that I could play with the audience. It wasn't just like a straight play where I had to do my acting straight with somebody, but I could actually engage with the audience. So all of those things were a good cocktail for me. Also, unlike Amanda, uh, I am not incredibly disciplined. Uh, I, I mess things up a lot. And so, like, what was a career where I could make a lot of mistakes? <laughs> Something that involved improvisation and you're supposed to be an idiot. So, <laughs> you know, if I could find a career in those things, like, okay, it was the only career possible for me. So, uh, and I, I want to come, I want to come back to that and, and chat about, um, about Clown in a moment. Uh, and, and about, but, but in general, were you working with pretty small, intimate audiences prior to being on, on a large scale? Oh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, I, we were working in, uh, in Kansas City, we started out, and then we were working in New York, and sometimes, you know, it would be like a, a, a few, like a few people in an audience sometimes, every, like every once in a while it would be that small, sometimes it's like hundreds, and, you know. I've done a lot of different sizes. I mean, I remember reading the Steve Martin book where he was talking about uh, performing for 10,000 people. I'm like, oh my goodness, what must that be like? I haven't done that. But I think he was like, he was something like only 2,500 people, you know, a small amount of people. And I thought, oh boy. <laughs> yeah, meanwhile, you and I were fighting for audiences of 40 people in Chicago two years ago. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that was a win. Um, so I, I, I'd love for you to, for the two of you, from both of your perspectives, to to know kind of what shifts in you. I know it's hard to say like, oh, I prefer large audiences. I prefer intimate audiences. But I think what I'm curious about is your approach. You know, uh, what, what that energy is like for you, um, how it affects you. Can I answer that? I, I do. Uh, financially, I like a larger audience. <laughs> but uh, artistically, I actually enjoy a smaller audience. I, I really, really like the, being able to have the connection with an audience. You can have it with a larger audience as well, but there's something about the thing that I think I'm best at is when I can have a closer connection, even if that is a large audience that I, that I can get out uh, in the middle of that audience and be connected to them in different ways. That's, I feel like, is the super sweet spot for me. And so, like, it's interesting. When you have those moments and you're, you're developing your career or you have the ups and downs of your career, depending on what format you're in, if you're working for a company like Cirque, where they've got this whole machine that's working to get, like, a lot of people there, or if you're doing everything yourself and you're on the street giving buyers to people, you know, calling your family and friends or whatever, you know, hoping people show up, you know, from all of that spectrum, you know, um, it's, it's, it's all good and they can all be beautiful and meaningful. Like even like, I remember thinking one time, like in New York where I was like, I mean, do I have the standard? I won't do a show for less than X amount of people. And unless what you're doing simply won't work, like, that's a valuable experience to see, like, what does it take still to keep an audience engaged and to make it personal, and what happens when it's super personal, because it's just, like, two of you, I've been at Fringe Festivals where I watched that, like, there was, I was the only person that showed up for a show, so it says, like, I'm going to do it, and it was just this really intimate experience, so be ready to, be ready to try it all. 
and that and that the, the, there's no shame in not having ten thousand people. You know, it's yeah. the, the the pleasure that the people are, are experiencing uh, together, or even just the awkwardness of like, Oof, this person doesn't like what I'm doing. Is one person here? Yeah. <laughs> it's it's a lot easier to forget about that one person when there's thousands. Yeah, yeah. Or you can um, focus on. I saw a cartoon once. I'll just end with this one for me. Like, there was some cartoon about you know what happens at a at a comedian's you know concert, and it was like hundreds of people laughing, and it says what a comedian sees, and it's just one person going like this. <laughs> <laughs> Always look at the people who are having fun. Somebody told me that once, and that's really important. One of the best things somebody said to me was like, look at the people who are enjoying you. That's going to like increase your fun, and your fun will, will spread out to other people. That's a so, great nugget. Always yeah. look at the people who are having fun, for sure. Um, I want to jump back to, uh, to talk, you know, with both of you being these roles where you're sort of in the middle of, of the action, um, we're going to pull up a clip right now of, of you know, Eric, you dodging some uh, performers uh, in a good way. Um, and, uh, and I was just curious, I want to hear the, the two of you talk about the sort of the idea of the danger of circus. Um, circus is inherently dangerous. And, you know, even though you might not be one of the ones doing insane, you know, acrobatics around the stage, you still have to be super present and super... Um, you know, with your, your head on a swivel. So I'd just love to hear the two of you talk a little bit about um, how to best do that and how to really be an ensemble um, and how to, how to keep each other safe and yourself safe. Um, I think we're, we're gonna play this with, uh, just as a little bit of background. So Eric, uh, feel free um, to comment on, on your, your uh, Skillful dodging. <laughs> what is this? This is, this is coming up into power track, I think, right? Yeah, track. I think yeah. I was, I mean, yeah. You know, in our creation for, for this show, and the show is, is constantly evolving still, uh, a lot of the these acrobats, all the choreography was done before I got put into it. So, uh, but I remember thinking like, oh, am I gonna have to go improvise with them in some way through this? And will I get smacked or will I hurt somebody? And definitely, when we first started, I would thought I was mostly nervous about getting somebody's way and injuring somebody else because I'd be in the wrong place. Because you could see, like, if you were in the wrong place, it could be. Uh, bad for somebody yeah so i always kept this phone during the creation i was like and i took people were laughing at me because i would take meticulous pictures of like where i was supposed to be at the stage and go over those notes and we're laughing at me because i my phone all the time taking pictures and writing on it but yeah i definitely felt concerned about that i've never had anybody run into me and i've just been in the right place has there ever been uh you know I, i'm curious about like the the process of uh you know general rules to follow to keep people safe even you know coming in and out of the wings i feel like everything has to be so specific uh, amanda even with musicians i mean you have uh instruments in front of you that are you know incredibly expensive and sometimes you're walking and moving around with them i mean like uh were there any close calls any you know near misses <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, there was, um, you know, during the one of the acts, one of the acrobats would have to bring the cello to me. Uh, and that was always, there were many times when uh, they were either running too fast or then and just kind Whoa. of falling and, and it was the only cello we had. So... <laughs> Uh, that always made me extremely nervous. Uh, they either run, run too fast with it or bump into somebody if they were in the wrong spot. Uh, you know, so, and I think too, it just really helps uh, also to know, like what Eric was saying, you know, he was taking notes of where everyone was. For me, I always 
I like to attend rehearsals that I'm not called for, but I know that I'm going to be in that scene. I may be called for the rehearsal later, but I like to attend it early just so that I can know where everyone is flying. Because there are, you know, there are certain times where I'd be in the middle of the stage, like in the, in the center of the stage, and having um, people flying in front of me and behind me. So I had to know exactly who was where and also know that when uh, when you have somebody else that's, let's say, it, it, uh, substituting in the role, their weight is different than the other person that's doing it, which means that they're flying at a different speed as well. So I know that, okay, uh, you know, Andrean is, uh, you know, flying today, which means she usually comes a little closer because of, you know, her weight. So I need to be about, like, you know, six inches back, cool. you know, so you have to know those things, um, you know, to, to make sure that you don't, it, to, to make sure you don't get hurt, to make sure you don't get uh, kicked in the head. <laughs> um, it must be interesting the first time that that happens where you discover like, oh, this person is different than this person. Oh, absolutely, because somebody's legs might be longer. So, which means that you have to know, she's, short, she's shorter than the girl who usually does it, so I don't need to be as cautious so it's that's why for me it always helps to go to the rehearsal see what's happening see who's doing it and see how they fly mm -hmm. uh see where they land when they fly because again it's you know depending on your weight the velocity of it is going to be a little different so you may land at a different a bit of a different spot and let me tell you six inches can make a big difference <laughs> so. and that like any particular role like let's say somebody flying or in a particular position in the circus like there might be like it's usually this person but there's probably three people like ready to place in let's say this person got injured this person got sick this person is away for some reason and it's like whoa you know so you gotta yeah there's a lot of that could change if it's the last minute change you need to always be on top of your game and know you know know what's happening uh know that this person is going to land a little closer yeah yeah i mean i i think what I hope uh, our, our aspiring performers take away from that more than anything is the sentence that I hope they beat into the back of their heads, which is attending rehearsals I was not called for. Um, uh, yeah, it helps. It really helps. And uh, I, I want to jump, I want to make a bit of a jump here. Um, Eric, I said we'd, we'd talk a little bit about uh, Clown again. Um, I, I, sometimes when I tell people about the different types of clown, I reference uh, uh, clown theater and how theatrical clown is sort of a, a, a cousin of circus clown. And uh, of course, that's, that's a uh, simplification and uh, Cirque du Soleil might even exist on a whole different sphere of perhaps, you know, spectacle clown. Um, but I was wondering if you could speak to that and you, how you define the difference, if at all between those types of clowns. Maybe it goes back to what we were talking about earlier with just a, an audience size. Um, but I'm curious if, if you talk about the difference ever. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's like you could ask the question, like if you put some theater into a, you know, you can take some theater and put it into a circus, you can take some circus and put it into the theater, and what does that do? So there's, like, you know, there's, there's black and there's white, and there's like a million shades in between. I think that's probably the, the truest answer, but but I think that maybe you could think of just about what are the given circumstances of the performance. Uh, so are you are you in a circus tent? Are you in some you know small fifty seat theater, two hundred or five hundred seat theater? Uh, are you is the show moving from uh, country, country with different languages where you can't use one particular language and text mm -hmm. so that you have to then use like a few word, universal words that everybody understands or it's just sound and motion so people can understand what you're doing uh, and I think all of those things can affect what you know what how much what the performance looks like I'm having uh, Joanna pull up uh, a fun picture right now can you tell us a little bit about uh, this show and, and uh, how when that was and where that came from. Yeah, that's uh, that's from a show uh, I made in uh, New York. 
called The Absence of Magic. And it was just about this kind of uh, guy, this clown, he's, he's in this place and he's stuck. He's in this uh, graveyard of, of, of old skeletons and dead things. And uh, he, he wants to leave, but he's kind of just too afraid to leave. So he makes up all these, you know, making up all these excuses and imagining and having this sort of imagination of an epic adventurer and about why he can't go. I, um, one of the reasons why I'm super excited to, to have you on and, and something that I would love to let our students know as much as possible is that, that idea of creating your own work alone. Um, and that, that's something that, uh, you know, you, you do with collaborators, uh, directors, uh, but that it's possible to literally, you know, create from scratch and, and you have a very uh, infamous character, uh, Buffon character that um, you, you know, toured all over the world with and that show starred only you. And so I, I just wonder if, if you could talk a little bit about um, what, what that's like, um, the idea that you don't need you know, uh, you don't need to wait to be cast and that you can, you can make a choice to make your own work. Absolutely. I, I, I'm fully, uh, full gratitude for the fact that, uh, that you don't have to wait to be, to be cast. Uh, you know, that doesn't guarantee it's going to be easy or a success or that you're going to get uh, paid or that, or that anybody's going to come. But you can do it, uh, so you're not waiting. Unless, of course, you procrastinate, unless you, unless you kind of like, you're saying like, I'll make it tomorrow, or I'll make it next week, and then you are waiting. But, um, yeah, my, my, the favorite things I've ever done were always when uh, I was working with somebody else to create something. And I, I actually, I would say that even though sometimes I'm the only person on stage, uh, I never make it alone. There are like, a, there are like, you know, millions of people that you that you make it with. It's like you're you're maybe you're working with a director, maybe you're working with a fellow actor, uh, maybe your wife says something really really smart to you uh, <laughs> about what you're doing. Maybe your friend says something. But no matter, you know, really, here's a good piece of advice. This this French guy in Iris uh, made me aware of is that like good ideas are all, are all over the place and don't think they have to come from you. Like somebody gives a good idea, be ready to, to say like, that's a great idea. Let's use this great idea. And a lot of the creation process is just generating these ideas. And like I worked with this uh, director, I tour, and we would make things and I'd be like, we're trying to find out how, how the, where does this thing go? Where's the ending? And every day I'm like, I got Eureka, I got this idea. And then a few days later, you think, oh, that's not, far, right? that's not the idea, you know? But he would say something sometimes, that's such a great idea. And sometimes my pride would be like, I, I want to make everything, but I, I feel like I have, I'm supposed to make everything myself. But just like, yeah, don't be alone. Take the good ideas from the people that, that are around you and love creating with you. Yeah. I think that that's great advice, especially for right now. You know, I, I think, uh, you know, with artists that are creating in isolation, I think uh, when we look at solo artists uh, that, that we want to create like, I think we forget that even they have sounding boards, even they have directors, they have a community and that, that, you know, even, you know, doing what we can right now, even if you're reaching out to somebody, one person, you don't have to put it on the internet to try something out and see what that person thinks. That's something that we have at our fingertips. All of my shows, uh, the most important parts of developing that show would be like, we would like, well, what if we do this? What if we do this? We make some things. And then, you know, a number of times from between when we began the creation process and when we first premiered the show to an audience, I would bring in like seven people, 10 people. I would not tell them what I was trying to do and I would just do it. And it would succeed or not succeed. And I would say, what did you experience? And I, not, not did you like it? Did you not like it? But like, what were the experiences you had? And then I would think about what I was trying to do, and then I would work from there. Mm -hmm. But it was very important just to have people watch the work 
and to try it out before I went to try to do the whole thing for an audience. Awesome. Uh, um, Amanda, I want to, if, if it would be okay with you, I'd like to play the clip um, that I found. Um, it's amazing what you can find on the internet. Uh, this is not you with your blue cello. This is you with a, a different cello. So um, uh, I'd like to, we'll just listen to it for a moment. I think it's only about a minute and a half, but I'd love for people to see kind of a, a good example of uh, what you do that's not, you know, masked in chaos for a moment. So uh, <laughs> let's play that clip. I'm so curious uh, about two things. I'd love to hear um, what it's like to, uh, you know, I, as a as a professional, uh, how your training persists and your practice persists uh, today. Um, not not just you know in in pandemic times, but also like what what's regular for you. Um, but then also, I, I would love to hear you talk a little bit about uh, live music in circus. Um, that's something that we're talking with our students uh, a lot about and uh, something that we want to start to integrate more into what we do is relying less on a track and, and what the difference is between a sound designer hitting play and having musicians flesh things out. Yeah, okay. well, I'm glad that you're uh, thinking about ways to bring live music rather than just have uh, a sound engineer hit a play button because as we all know things can go really wrong in a live production right mm -hmm. uh on stage and i can say that there have been so many times <laughs> where <laughs> things have gone wrong and you have to um since you're you're playing you have a live musician there that can take over and um repair that but <laughs> you know make a uh, start improvising uh, there are many times uh you know dur during a show where some equipment piece wasn't ready you know like the poles haven't come down through the air so uh, uh you know i'm wearing uh, in-ear monitors in my ear so i've got a lot of people talking to me while i'm playing so uh and they they're telling me uh we have to vamp so which means i need to uh start making up something to play and kind of saving that moment and making the audience feel like nothing wrong, you know, uh, this is how it's supposed to be. So I think that having live musicians is such a, a blessing to have on a show where, you know, they can essentially save the day. <laughs> um, that, that's, uh, I think that's super important. And, and also, you know, the sound is so different course to have a live musician versus a track playing you know yes it, it's uh it's always going to sound much better uh with a live musician playing and of course having the sound engineer there to help bring that sound because in a tent you uh sometimes you're in a city that's super humid so the sound is going to change significantly 
uh, whether, or, or if you're in a dry city, it's the same, the sound's going to change uh, a lot. So you have to have that sound engineer that's going to bring up the drums a little more so that the audience can hear this more, or bring up the vocals, you know, because the vocals are being drowned out by the guitars, or, you know, so you need a, a good balance of all that, because uh, it's, the sound's always going to change when you're moving from city to city, you know, and you don't have something that's temperature controlled. And you have to be able to work around that as well, you know. Yeah. There have been many times, too, where I'm wearing my in-ear monitors, and let's say that something goes out. Like, I, I've had plenty of times where, for some reason, um, I go out to sing, and all of a sudden, my click track is gone, and I can't hear anything. <laughs> so it, it's like, it's so nerve-wracking, <laughs> but you have to, again, you have to show the audience that nothing's wrong. And that, uh, you know, everything is uh, going as planned and you have to sing as if everything's going as planned. And, uh, you know, I think it's super important to have a really good uh, trained ear for that type of, uh, for those type of things. I think um, and to be able to not freak out and, <laughs> you know, because the ah. audience can tell when you're nervous. The audience can tell when you're not sure what's happening, you know, it's... Uh, you know, so you really have to convince yourself that, you know, you got it. <laughs> this lady has nerves of steel. Like she, like if she's, you know, if she was sick, like nothing could keep her from doing the show and doing a professional job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I spent, I spent my first uh, six months of Amaluna on chemo treatments. Like I was getting chemo treatments during my first six months so i didn't miss a single performance though like i uh you know i would be backstage and thinking oh, i'm gonna throw up i'm gonna throw up like i it's coming i know it's coming you know because that's a side effect I'm but the, 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 the curtains would open <laughs> the curtains would open and i'd walk on stage and let me tell you like any pain i had any nauseous feeling any anything i had just completely went away yeah. because I became so focused on being on stage and performing and it's it's amazing what your brain can do like how powerful mind over matter really is uh, when you go out there and you're you're laser focused and uh, everything else just slides away fun uh, fact a lot of people don't know that that water bowl the inspiration came from a, a toilet bowl of youth possibly throwing up into it <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> um, hey, y'all, I want to be super conscious of time. Uh, sure. And uh, I, I wanted to ask a couple more questions. Um, first of all, um, just want to talk about tour life for a moment. If you could, and I know this is a lot, but if you could just distill down of like, what's a big struggle that's very real, you know? Uh, one of the things that we tell our students all the time is, you know, it's, circus is not all glam and glitz. It's, it's, uh, it's tough. The business behind it and the lifestyle is, is hard, but it's worth it. So if you could give me an idea of, of what a struggle is, but then why it's worth it. Your bed is always different. <laughs> you never know what the bed's going to be like. <laughs> Just the, 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 the things are that you, you, sometimes you may find yourself if you travel a lot, you may find yourself in a place where there's not much reference to where you are. Like, let's say you go to a movie theater and it goes black for a second. Or let's say you're just in a, a really, uh, you're in like a, a bathroom stall which just has walls. Sometimes I'm like, where am I? What country? What city? What time? What language do I need to speak? Like, it becomes like, which one of the files do I pull to communicate and navigate once I leave this space. Do you experience the same thing? Yeah, for sure. You, you kind of forget what city you're actually in when you're traveling so much. So, uh, yeah, it's a little hard sometimes to get your bearings. But I, I would say one of the hardest things, too, is uh, missing your family is, mm -hmm. is a big one. Uh, not being able to see your family uh, because you're on tour. And um, I, I think that... Well, obviously, with you know, with internet and everything, you can talk to them online, but it's not the same thing. Because you, you, 
you have to remember you're going to miss holidays. You're going to miss birthdays. You're going to miss Christmas. You're going to miss Thanksgiving. You're going to miss Hanukkah. You're going to miss like all those big important things that you used to do as a family. You know, everyone, like everybody else is doing it back home and you're not a part of it. So that's, a, that's difficult to um, come to terms with sometimes when you're really missing them. But I think the important thing is, is that you have to realize that you have a tour family as well. So you have to make that circus family or, or, or you know, whoever you're on tour with, um, that's, that has to be your family as well. And you have to treat those people uh, with love and respect and, 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 and lift each other up and so that you can get the sense of family that's so important to have on tour. You know, don't isolate yourself. Don't, you know, don't, don't, uh, go, go to those parties, you know, go hang out and, and, and go out with groups of people and make friends on, on the tour and, um, participate in events. Uh, that's all going to help, uh, things like missing your family, that's going to really help, help with that. Sure. Yeah. Um, I'm curious about, you know, not just tour, but about, you know, um, any of the, this can apply to any of the shows that you've worked on. Just, just what your, what your favorite part of the entire process would be, um, just overall. I love creation. <laughs> I love the long, uh, I love the way you have to adapt to when things change. Uh, even though sometimes I can get too attached, emotionally attached to, to, to a certain thing that's happening on stage. And then all of a sudden they're like, hey, we're going to change that. We're going to take it away. Or, You're not in the scene anymore. So uh, you have to, uh, uh, you, you have to learn to adapt to all those things. But I, I love watching how much a show can have can evolve, you know, especially you know, like Amma Luna evolved a million times. Uh, mm -hmm. So it was constantly changing. But I love that process of creating new things and um, on stage or, or finding ways to make it better. You know, it, I think I feel like I, I don't ever want to be satisfied with like, oh, this is the best it is. And it's never going to get any better. It, you know, you have to say it's old, it can always get better. And let's find a way. So that's, that's my favorite part. Yeah. Continuing that creation process. I like, um, you know, if you end up doing a show where you're doing a, a lot, you know, sometimes you make shows and they go up like one time. Sometimes it's like a weekend of shows or a week or a month of shows or sometimes you have a show that runs for years. Like when you have something that's going on and on, a lot of it is this becomes not the same, but you you hit the marks. This needs to happen, this needs to happen, this needs to happen. And I like when you discover new things. And some days, it, you know, it's possible some days you might think, this happens, this happens, this happens. Like, you could put your mind into that, like, you know, these things are going to happen. And other days, when you open your eyes, you see how every little thing is different that day. Uh, and the connection, you connect with the people on stage, if it's a wink or a smile, you do something a little different for them so that, it, you know, it makes it fresh for them. That, I, I really love that. Yeah, keeping it fresh. I feel like a lot of our, uh, you know, students are younger performers when they, they think that they've done a lot of shows when they're five in, uh, when they, you know, kind of could use the perspective of doing a show, you know, 42 times and still needing to keep it fresh. Yeah. Um, hey, so I, I want, I'm keeping an eye on time. It's just a little bit past seven. Um, I'm sure, like most of the world, you're uh, just as sick of Zoom calls as everyone else. But I want to thank you so much for taking the time because, uh, you know, even just this, this one hour for those who are watching, it, it, it is definitely lifting spirits. And I'm sure everyone is excited to, to have had this conversation as I am. Um, but before I let you go, I just want to know if there's anything that you want to plug. Um, Eric, I know that uh, you are teaching uh, online soon, and I, I wanted to see if you wanted to let everybody know about that. Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm uh, teaching a, a series of Buffon classes. It's like a clown, like that, that mischievous clown I was talking about before. 
Um, and it's if you go to a website called Movement Theater Studio.com, you'll see it there. It's, uh, it'll say Buffon with Eric Davis. But you can just look it up and look up Movement Theater Studio NYC, any of that stuff. You should be able to find it. Movement Theater Studio NYC. Yeah, Movement Theater Studio Studio.com. To Google. Right. Okay. Um, Amanda, what, what about you? Where can people find you in the world? Is there anything that we should follow? Um, at the moment, I don't have anything going personally. Um, we've been moving around a lot. <laughs> so yeah. I, was also, I was in the middle of preparing for auditions and, you know, when everything hit. Um, so I don't have anything for my own personal thing, but there is a uh, website called uh, sweetrelief.org. And it is something that uh, it's an organization, a nonprofit organization that helps uh, that's helping musicians uh, because a lot of them are, are are gig workers. You know, you just uh, you know, there's there's no uh, nowhere for them to get government help. You know, during this or or could you repeat or, the name of the organization? Joanne is going to type a link so everyone can access it. Sweetrelief.org. Uh, yeah, so. It's a nonprofit organization, and um, there you can help uh, donate to that community of musicians that are really struggling at the moment, uh, who, who don't have any way to get any kind of help from the government. Uh, unfortunately, mm -hmm. the, the government isn't so keen on helping gay workers at the moment, so, uh, you know, got to help each other out. Yeah, it is, it is complicated, and we all need just a little bit of, of assistance from each other. Um, yeah. Well, great. Uh, both of those links are in the chat for those who are interested. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I have some things I want to I want to talk about uh, when it comes to uh, Circus Steam and what we've got coming up. But I will uh, I will let the two of you go. Thank you so much for making the time. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing both of you down the road. Thank you. So it's great to see you, Scott. You Good luck to everybody. Yeah. Uh, enjoy your Enjoy your, your circus experiences. Yeah, have fun. <laughs> um, have fun. Well, number one. the circus experience that we have coming up, uh, the quickest is our spring circus. Um, so this year's spring circus is going digital. Um, it's going to be a little bit different than the virtual variety shows that we've had in the last couple of weeks. Um, this one we will have edited together, so it's going to be really special. Um, we're working with uh, an editor that actually uh, the last – uh, time we worked with Cirque du Soleil, uh, specifically with uh, Cirque du Monde, uh, they funded our um, our social circus festival, and they helped us find this really incredible editor. And we're working with the same uh, video editor to create uh, this beautiful production of students performing from their own homes. Uh, we'll also have a retrospective of other past spring circuses from the last seven years or so here at Alternatives, um, and then. Uh, and just a little bit of a nod uh, to everybody safe at home. So it's gonna be really special. You can join by making a minimum contribution of $10. Uh, that information is on our website. Uh, we're gonna throw up a link there in the chat in a moment as well. So that's June 12th at 5 p.m. Um, everybody who makes that, that minimum donation, you'll get an automatic link to watch. And also, it won't be like this, where it won't be available to watch uh, the next day, just recorded um, or on YouTube. That's only going to be available to those who uh, purchase a ticket. So uh, we hope everyone in the community joins us for that. Um, also, we are teaching a, a weekly class called Circus in Place. It's going to be on Mondays starting June 15th and going through July uh, 13th. Uh, that's 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. for ages 6 to 10, 5.15 to 6.15, ages uh, 11 to 16. Um, so these circus classes are taught uh, live from your homes. If you're in the Chicagoland area and you sign up for one of these classes or you have a young one who might be interested in a once-a-week digital class, we will deliver them a props kit um, of juggling balls, juggling scarves, uh, balancing feather, and fire sticks. We'll bring that to your home, and uh, that way you can utilize those throughout the five-week session. So we're really excited about that initiative as well. If you have word of mouth is always the best way to spread the word about what we do and what artists do in general, but especially right now. If you have kids that are at home needing a little bit of extra enrichment, uh, please let them know. Uh, send them our way. Uh, 
also that goes for um, all of our social media as well. We're putting out new content all the time on YouTube and on Facebook. We have a series that we're really proud of called Quarantine with Circus Steam, where our instructors from home are giving you uh, short tutorials, anywhere from eight to 15 minutes, uh, varying different types. So make sure to check those out. Those are available on demand whenever you want. Um, and they're free, so why not? Uh, and it's a great way to, to spend your time at home. Uh, and just uh, like us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, do all that good stuff, subscribe to our YouTube channel, especially uh, now that we're putting out all, such great uh, stuff. Um, and then these two artists that joined me today, look, uh, look up their stuff as well. Google's a beautiful tool. Uh, Amanda Zidow and Eric Davis, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. We'll see you down the road. Thank you. Bye, Bye guys. Bye, all.